Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 6th, 2007. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week we talked to home brewer Benji Edwards of Columbus, Ohio, about cask conditioning real ale, essentially kegging without the use of CO2 to carbonate your beer. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com. You can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. But just a very quick thanks to everybody who's been picking up our new low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD and our 2008 Brewer's Logbook at basicbrewing.com. And for those of you who have basic brewing items on your Christmas list, there's still time. And uh, just to let you know, if you order uh, before noon on Central Time, I I usually get those items in the mail that same day, unless they're orders for shirts. And uh, shirts and and hats are made to order at a local shirt shop, and they take a day or two more. Well, now let's move on to the mailbag. If you'll remember last week, Stephen wrote in asking about the practice of boiling wort from an all-grain batch the day after mashing. Stephen's a family man with limited time and wants to use the process to uh, help brewing fit into his schedule better. And who couldn't use that? Andrew from Bakersfield, California, writes uh, with a response. Andrew says, in your most recent podcast, you read a letter from a listener curious about overnight mashing. Some people over at brewboard.com, a regular online hangout for me, have been doing that for years and have created an an FAQ. And uh, Andrew sends a a link, and I'll post that link in the uh, description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Andrew says, here are the cliff notes. You must pay extra attention to temperatures because if the grain gets too cool, the sparge water might not be hot enough to do its job. This is often best handled using a sleeping bag or blankets over your insulated mash tun. Putting as little time as possible between mashing and sparging is a good idea. Perhaps mash in right before bed and then sparge and boil first thing next morning. This deals with a temperature loss issue and also might mitigate some of the bacteria concerns. Uh, Andrew says, as to wort fermentability, a concern when mashing too hot or too cold, just as with a normal mash, the final fermentability of the wort is more a function of the temperature that the mash starts out at, not the temperature the mash finishes up at, as long as the temperatures remain fairly steady over time. And Andrew says, uh, the biggest question, bacteria creating off flavors during the extended mash. Andrew says, according to this FAQ, not really. Many beer-spoiling bacteria, including lactobacillus, don't survive a mash very well. Most lactobacillus strains cannot survive temperatures above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Andrew says, hope this helps your listener. Well, thanks very much, Andrew, for sending that in. I think Stephen was asking about mashing, laudering, and sparging, and then keeping the kettle of wort overnight and boiling it the next day. So it may be a bit of a different process. However, there's some good information in there that does apply directly, like the beginning temperature being important to the fermentability of the of the wort. Um, after reading up on the overnight mashing process, maybe Andrew could shift his procedures to try that too, to see if that helps fit into his uh, busy schedule as well. So thanks, Andrew, for sending that link in. And again, I'll post it on the site. Uh, Matthias from Vancouver, British Columbia writes in, I'm excited for the Brewing Blunders show. I wrote to you over a year ago suggesting a show about mishaps. I told you the story about my lager yeast starter jug breaking and how I got stuck in the wine cellar where the yeast starter was growing because the doorknob fell off on the outside of the cellar. (laughs) I had to wait for my wife to come home and let me out. Sadly, there was no corkscrew, so I just had to chill out and wait. I do remember that story, and uh, the <laughs> that's a, that was a funny one. I, I appreciate your reminding me of that, Matthias. And, and uh, that reminds me uh, to remind you to uh, send in your, your brewing nightmare stories. I've still uh, got some more, but, you know, I'm a greedy man. I'd like some more. So send those in to james at basicbrewing.com or use the contact form on basicbrewing.com. Tell us your nightmare stories. Uh, and uh, we can learn from them and pass them on to everybody else. Anyway, Matthias says, I have a question about getting orange flavor and aroma 
into a chocolate porter. The porter is finished, and it tastes great. Should I dry out some orange peel and let it steep in the beer? I've made wit beers this way, but I've always added the peel at the end of the boil. Your help and experience is appreciated. I'm hoping this will be a great Christmas beer. Well, I don't know about experience, but I, <laughs> I can make stuff up. Uh, I wrote a couple of suggestions to uh, Matthias, but to keep in mind, actually, I haven't actually done this myself. But this is what I would do if I were in your situation. Uh, first off, I wouldn't dry the orange peel. I'd use it fresh. You get more fresh, you know, stuff, juice in there. Uh, doing it that way. I've used a potato peeler in the past to get the zest off of oranges, and that works great. Be sure to wash them well. Um, you know, there may be some wax or something on there that you, you want to wash off of your oranges. Uh, if it were me, I would draw off, you know, two or three cups of beer, heat it on the stove to around 150 degrees Fahrenheit or around 65 degrees Celsius, and uh, steep the orange peel in there for a while. And uh, you could even draw off a portion of beer from the secondary, a gallon or so, um, to use it as a test batch and, and pour some of this tea in to test the flavor to see how you're doing. That way, if you don't like it, you're not risking a whole batch of this uh, wonderful chocolate porter uh, that you know you already like. You know, you could even bottle up some of the chocolate porter without the orange and serve it as an option for your holiday guests at your Christmas party. You know, it, it would make you look uh, like you worked harder than you actually did. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. Um, good to hear from you, Matthias, and let us know how it all turns out. Jake from Las Vegas writes in with a similar sort of question. Uh, Jake says, I wonder if you've ever heard of or heard of or tried steeping specialty grains in a secondary. Would this really do anything? Now, again, I haven't tried this, but I'm sure you could do it. Uh, the one thing that you'd have to look out for is to make sure the grains that you're steeping don't need to be actually mashed. You know, you don't want any unconverted starches in your in your beer. Uh, you wouldn't want to steep a base malt that hadn't been converted in the in the mash. But if you wanted to try steeping some crystal malt or something like that in the secondary, uh, you could use a grain bag, and of course it'd be more easy uh, if it were in a bucket instead of a carboy at this point. You could do it cool. You could steep it cool. But, you know, you'd get quicker results if you did what I suggested for the orange peel and pulled off some beer, heated it to around 150 degrees Fahrenheit, again, 65 degrees Celsius, and uh, made your sort of tea that way. And you'd also get more control over color that way. You know, you could only add back to the main batch of beer however much you wanted to get the, the color effect or even the flavor effect that you're looking for. So uh, let me know if you guys try these things. Uh, I'd like to hear how they turn out. Okay, let's get on to our interview for this week. Benji Edwards has an impressive home brewery in Columbus, Ohio. Part of his passion is traditional real ales that are conditioned the old-fashioned way in a cask. I asked Benji to spend a few minutes with us to give us the lowdown on the process. Well, Benji Edwards, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored. Well, I, I'm, I'm honored that you're honored. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are here to talk about uh, cask-conditioned ales. And uh, I took a look at your website, uh, the Boathouse Brewery, and, uh, man, you've got quite the setup there. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it's been one of my great passions. I've been uh, getting more and more involved with it. been brewing for over uh, 10 years now, and it's just one of these things that, you know, as most of your listeners probably know, can get more and more uh, involved and much more uh, of, a, of an obsession almost. It is a slippery slope for sure. Um, where did you, when did you get into uh, cask conditioning beers and why? I think the first... Uh, first exposure I probably had to um, not necessarily cast condition, but English beer was when I was back in college. A friend and I were trying uh, different types of beer when we were getting into the sort of craft brewing scene, even though it wasn't necessarily called that back then. Uh, this was in the early to mid-90s. Um, 
We tried a lot of the uh, bottle-conditioned English beers, which are actually um, real ale, as we'll talk about, uh, just like uh, most homebrew is that's bought, you know, that's been bottled. Um, and I just really like that. And since then, I've been able to travel to England uh, several times, and I always enjoy the highlight of my trip is uh, going into the pubs and trying the uh, the cast condition nails on uh, on the hand pump there. And it's just, uh, I think it's the greatest um, type of beer. I guess the greatest sort of not a style particularly, but just the way to to uh, serve it. So those of us who bottle our home brews have been making real ale all along. Yes. You may not even know it, but uh, it's considered real ale, according to the definition, which um, in the Oxford English Dictionary is draft or bottled beer brewed from traditional ingredients, matured by secondary fermentation in the container from which it is dispensed, and served without the use of extraneous carbon dioxide. Ah, well, there you go. That's the technical definition. Um, Homebrew, of course, if it's been uh, primed and there's uh, yeast in it, and it's uh, undergone a fermentation in there to carbonate it, that is considered real ale. And uh, the campaign for real ale, the consumer group in, in England, that's basically responsible for saving this kind of beer from extinction back in the 70s, um, recognizes both the cask-conditioned ale, which is, of course, the type that's served in a, in a larger vessel, a cask, uh, but also the bottled beer that home brewers produce and that some commercial brewers are producing, the bottle conditioned ales are also the same, same, fall under the same umbrella, let's say. So, what's the big deal? I mean, if you're a home brewer and say you keg already with uh, CO2 uh, forced uh, kegs, why would you want to switch? What's what's the uh, attraction? Well, uh, we'll talk about that. I I don't know if I would advocate switching. Um, I do both. I have both uh, forced carbonation beers as well as the cask-conditioned ales. Uh, as we'll talk about, there's more work involved with the cask-conditioned ales, so it's probably impractical for uh, even the lovers of cask-conditioned ale to do that strictly, at least in, uh, in this country, where it's not as prevalent as back in uh, uh, Britain. But, uh, of course, the most important reason is the taste. Um, Cast conditioned ale or real ale usually has a lower level of carbonation than something that's been forced carbonated with uh, CO2 from a gas cylinder. Uh, so it has a, uh, a lighter mouthfeel, and the carbonation being a lower level sort of lets the, the malt and the hop flavors come through better. You can really appreciate some of the subtle flavors of these types of beer, which are typically lower in alcohol than maybe what we're used to. Uh, the other thing is is the serving temperature is usually a little bit uh, higher than maybe what we're used to in this country with the, uh, uh, the forced carbonation beers. Uh, typically, we're talking about cellar temperature, which um, is around 50 degrees. And what styles lend themselves uh, most to being cask conditioned? Uh, the easy answer to that is probably all British-style ales, uh, because that's typically what has been historically cask-conditioned. Now, of course, back before the days of, of um, CO2 and gas cylinders and, and forced carbonation, all beer, in a sense, was real ale or cask-conditioned, because the only way to get the, uh, the carbonation was to actually ferment it in the vessel in which it was going to be served. But... Uh, what I've found is I appreciate most the, uh, the traditional English styles. You know, we're talking about uh, bitter, best bitter, mild, brown ale, porter, stout. Uh, barley wines are even very nice in the, in the cask. Hmm. Uh, but then also extending from that, um, our brewing scene here in America, um, our American pale ales and uh, India pale ales are wonderful in the cask, and thankfully there are more and more breweries here in the, the U.S. that are um, getting involved with cask conditioning, and we can try some of our American styles that way and, and really uh, appreciate their flavors even more, I think, in this, in this method. So what have you got on tap now at the, at the brewery at home? Um, cask conditioned-wise, I have um, mostly lower-gravity uh, session beers. Um, I've got a couple of best bitters. Uh, most of them are usually 
inspired by um, a great tasting beer that I tried back in England. Um, and then I've also got uh, uh, more of an American style beer, which will be I'll be tapping this weekend. It's called Hophead. It's from a small uh, craft brewery in uh, England called Dark Star. And they brew a beer that's just 100% Maris Otter Pale Malt and 100% Cascade mm. hops from um, you know, Oregon or Washington. And it's a, it's a great uh, light uh, session beer. It's under 4% alcohol, and you really get the, the great citrusy flavors of the Cascade. Um, and then I'll have a uh, porter on here pretty soon. But I've got a couple of uh, the stainless steel firkins, which are the, um, about 10.5 U.S. gallon. It's 9 U.K. gallon vessels. Um, and then I've also got a pin, which is the name for a smaller uh, uh, stainless steel cask. It's half the size. It's a good homebrew size because it's just over five gallons. So if you're brewing a five-gallon batch, it fits great in there. Um, and, of course, because of the limited um, shelf life of these beers, um, you know, it's, it's important to be able to consume um, the beer, even if you're using blanket pressure, pressure which I can explain. Uh, even if you're using blanket pressure, you still want to want to try to uh, get through the, the beer that you have within, at the most, probably two to four weeks. Yeah, that that is one drawback to uh, cast conditioning is that when you're pushing a, a beer with CO2, uh, the CO2 is uh, is not going to stale your beer, but something different is happening when you cask condition beers, right? Exactly. Um, the traditional way to do it is to vent the cask to the atmosphere. So whatever air you have, um, wherever the vessel is, is going straight into the cask, and it will not only change the uh, flavor, but of course eventually, within probably three to five days, spoil the beer and, and turn it into vinegar. Hmm. So it is, um, that is probably the main drawback of the, uh, of the style compared to um, the normal uh, forced carbonation beer. It uh, does have a limited shelf life. The other uh, potential drawback is that it is a little, usually a little bit more work to actually prepare and serve the beer. Um, so if you've got a barley wine, uh, which you know usually benefits uh, from aging, how does that? How does your strategy change? Change from from a traditional if you would be forced carbonating it or change it, right. changing it versus a, a session beer. Well, ver- well, uh, either or both. I mean, if you're going to say lay down a a, a barley wine for a while, uh, can you lay it down in a, in a cask? Yes, you certainly can. And in fact, one of the best. Uh, cask condition ales I ever had was a, a small wooden, uh, it was an oak cask uh, served at the Real Ale Festival in Chicago a number of years back. It was uh, a barley wine from England, uh, Harvest Ale from J.W. Lee's, mm. that was served in an old uh, whiskey cask that was primed, they actually primed the beer with uh, a single malt scotch whiskey. That beer was absolutely phenomenal, I and mean, the complexity was just uh, incredible. Uh, and this was all before, of course, the uh, the real um, bourbon barrels and oak aging um, movement sort of caught on in this country. But you can certainly do it. The good thing about a barley wine, um, for instance, is the high gravity. So because you've got so much alcohol in there, you know, 8 or 10 or 12 percent, that will usually hold off and prolong um, the bugs or the, the bacteria that could eventually uh, cause the beer to go off. I haven't actually cast conditioned the barley wine myself, so I can't speak from from direct experience. But I know that uh, there are breweries all over England doing this. Uh, typically, you know, this time of year around the holidays, and I think most of the breweries do a smaller serving size. You know, they'll do a pin or a firkin rather than one of the larger 18-gallon um, or 36-gallon casks. And um, to my knowledge, from what I've heard, they'll they'll last for um, a longer period. Probably, if you're venting it to the atmosphere, I would guess a barley wine would keep for one to two weeks. Mm. And of course, um, if you're using top pressure or blanket pressure, um, which is replacing the um, beer that's drawn out of the cask with carbon dioxide from a tank, but it's replacing it at atmospheric pressure rather than you know, a higher pressure from uh, from a, a forced carbonation setup, a draft setup. 
So and in those cases, you can definitely get a much longer shelf life. Uh, I do use the cast breather, uh, which is the device that uh, allows you to use the uh, uh, atmospheric CO2. And it, it gives me, even on a low-gravity session beer, like a 35 or 4% beer, it gives me uh, anywhere from two to four weeks hmm. uh, shelf life in order to drink that beer rather than the usual three to five days. Now, for the real ale purists, is that uh, considered cheating? It is, yes. If you ask the campaign for real ale, they will tell you that they do not support the use of the cast breather. Uh, they don't They don't accept its use in pubs. Um, their argument is that uh, pubs should just be able to order the size cask that they can consume, that their customers can consume in a, a, a reasonable period, 72 hours or, or a couple of uh, days to maybe four or five days. Um, pubs obviously go through beer a lot quicker than us home brewers. Um, so I think, although I may agree with them that most pubs probably don't need to use it, and uh, perhaps it does uh, affect the flavor of the beer, I certainly think that for home brewing, its, its use is almost essential. The only times I ever serve a, a cask beer without a a demand valve, you know, the cask breather set up is if I'm having a party and we know we're going to drink the cask that night or mm. or over the weekend. So so how do we get into it? For those of us who, uh, who don't have the equipment and are starting from scratch, where should we start? What kind of gear will we need? Well, to try to start things off on a budget, which most of us homebrewers are, certainly um, if you're trying cask condition ale for the first time, you don't want to probably spend... $500 or more on all the equipment that you could conceivably use. Um, my recommendation would be to stick with the vessels that you currently have. Uh, if you're already using corny kegs, you can uh, serve uh, cask conditioned ale really well in, in a corny keg. I guess in that situation, some people call it keg conditioned ale. You're still conditioning it in that vessel, but it's a keg rather than a cask. Um, that's the way I started out, and in fact, I would say probably still the majority of the uh, the real ale that I drink is served out of a corny keg. Uh, corny kegs are great for being able to vent the excess pressure because you have that lift ring on the top. Um, they're great because they seal really well, and if you click on um, your gas disconnect that's hooked up to the, uh, the cask breather, you have no way of any outside air getting in, and so you can be sure that you're keeping the environment inside the keg um, basically sanitary because uh, you're getting your CO2 from your tank. So there's no risk of any letting the air in that it will spoil it. Um, you will need the cask breather, which is generally about a $50 investment. Uh, you can get these types of things from, from different places. Uh, there's sources in England. There's also a place here in uh, the U.S. There's a website I can mention it's uh, ukbrewing.com um, they sell not only the cask breather equipment but also um, the more involved equipment such as the stainless steel uh, casks and also the uh, the hand pumps or the beer engines so do you have to uh, modify your existing corny keg in any way if you're conditioning the in, thing in i would suggest uh, to do is to cut off the dip tube the beer dip tube that reaches to the bottom of the keg. Some home brewers may have already done that just to serve their beer uh, the regular way. Um, I use all my kegs uh, modified that way, even the ones I serve with CO2. I think it just allows you to uh, leave the yeast that's at the bottom of the, uh, the beer there. Uh, some people, you know, keep the tube going all the way down to the middle and the bottom, and it'll pick up, you know, the first pint will pick up all the yeast. I think for cask conditioning, that's a mistake. You don't want to move the yeast out of the beer on the first pint that you draw because that yeast is actually what makes it um, real out, what makes it cask conditioned. And you want to keep the yeast in there as long as you can because as a living thing, it will continue to change the flavor of your beer, which is part of the... Um, the complexity of real ale, and also uh, I think it'll help protect it because it'll keep uh, the yeast in there will keep the beer carbonated. Mm. Uh, it'll stay in there and it'll allow uh, fermentation to continue even as you're drinking it, and then when you're venting the beer to serve it, you're not losing all the carbonation the first time that you uh, actually vent and serve the beer. 
So would you take off like an inch of the tube? Yeah, I think what I did was I took off more than an inch because the dip tubes I, I was modifying were all bent. So what I did first was to straighten them out, and then I would cut off as much as would uh, I would need to remove in order to keep the dip tube about, I would say, an inch off the very bottom of the the keg. Now, of course, the the bottom is not flat. It's uh, curved. So what I typically shoot for is to have the dip tube end about a quarter to a half an inch of the side of the keg where it's going to be uh, dropping down. Hmm. And then the other thing that I like to do, of course, uh, and a lot of homebrewers do, is dry hop directly in the cask or the keg. Um, it gives you uh, a great hop aroma that way. And uh, if you uh, use some kind of a, a strainer on your dip tube, you can just, what I do is I attach one of these sure screens, which is a very small stainless steel tube that's uh, a mesh. And that way you can add hops directly to the keg, and uh, that screen will filter it out. And that just slides, you can just slide it right onto the dip tube. You don't need to clamp it or anything. Hmm. Uh, and the other method I've used before is the, um, you know, those cotton hop sacks. And uh, what I typically do with those is fill them with the hops after sanitizing the, the sack, then uh, actually zip-tying the, uh, the sack to about, let's say, the bottom quarter of the dip tube, maybe a couple of inches from the end of the dip tube so it's not interfering with the flow of the beer out. But you want to keep the, uh, the hops down inside the beer. If you just throw the sack in there loose, I think it'll float the entire time you're, mm. you're serving it. That's a good point. Um, so if you if you want to to get a, a, a cask, you have the choice of the uh, the smaller pin or the firkin, and mm-hmm. uh, and I think that you know just because of my sense of humor, I would I would get a firkin just so I could offer my friends a firkin beer. But, sure. Uh, <laughs> but, Why not? <laughs> but uh, so so what kind of gear besides the the cask itself? What kind of gear are we going to have to get? Are we going to have to get a beer engine? I noticed that in, in the photos on your site, you've got three uh, beer engines on your bar. Yes. Uh, if you want to serve the, uh, the corny kegs um, as they normally would be served, in, in other words, vertically, you do need uh, a beer engine and a hand pump because, to, to my knowledge, there's no other way to actually um, hydraulically move the beer out of the, uh, of the keg. Now, you don't necessarily have to go with the rather expensive uh, traditional English beer engines that are produced by numerous companies. There are plans out there. You can uh, find articles in Brew Your Own. Um, there's, I think there was one within the last year or two about how to make your own, uh, and usually they're from some other kind of pump device. I think what's uh, popular is using uh, some kind of... Uh, a, a pump that was designed for another use, such as a marine pump. Hmm. Um, in fact, my first beer engine was homemade. I followed plans out of a Brew Your Own article from many years ago, probably around 2000 or so. And that worked well enough um, for the purposes, but of course, as you get more and more involved in it, and if you really enjoy the beer uh, this way, you probably eventually want to uh, want to get a hand pump, just because um, really, I mean, it's a classy thing to have. <laughs> Your friends will all be impressed. <laughs> and that's what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. We all lust over these, you know, stainless steel vessels and the uh the stainless steel draft systems and towers and you know, if you're gonna go into uh cast condition now you have to go with the uh shiny brass hand pump with the oak uh the oak uh, plinth it's called and then the uh <laughs> the ceramic handle and then you can put your uh your beer on display that way. So, so essentially, uh, when you're using a hand pump, you're, you, you don't have the pressure uh, of the CO2 to push the beer uh, to you. You're actually pumping uh, the beer uh, up into uh, the tap, essentially. Yes, there's a, there's a cylinder in there in the inner workings of the hand pump. It's usually either a quarter pint or a half pint in size. Um, just a small point. If you're a home brewer, you probably want to go with a quarter pint draw because that pulls out a quarter of a pint with each pull. Um, that leaves less beer sitting in the cylinder, uh, which is less beer that can sit there and, and warm up mm. uh, if you're not serving it constantly. Um, there are hand pumps that have 
cooling jackets around the cylinder. So if you have a glycol cooling system, if you're really uh, technologically advanced, you can actually um, insulate and cool that cylinder. But that's probably beyond the scope of most uh, home brewers. And, uh, and I've never been tempted to do that. And there is a technique to, uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a wondrous thing to watch a, a beer, a pint being uh, hand-pulled. Yes. It, it's just a different looking thing. It's fun to watch, and believe me, it's even more fun to do it yourself. <laughs> so what is the proper technique? Um, well, you want to pull all the way back, a steady, slow motion. Uh, some people are hauling off on it, you know, like it's uh, um, some kind of emergency. But uh, certainly <laughs> a steady flow is best. Um, you don't want to agitate the beer too much. Um, that leads us into another topic, the, the use of a sparkler. Uh, that's sort of a controversial area in the in the world of real ale. Uh, and there are different ways you can dispense it. In the north of England, um, customers are very much used to a very large head of foam on their beer. And so they have special uh, faucets and spouts that have been developed, which actually agitate the beer on purpose as it comes out. And then the sparkler is the last element of that. It's a small plastic uh, threaded um, device that goes on the uh, the end of the spout, and it forces the beer through these tiny little holes, which further aerates it and causes uh, a, a larger head of foam on the beer. Um, the downside to that, if you ask me, I'm, I'm a big into the southern style of dispense, which is a very short nozzle, very short spout on the engine with no breather, or excuse me, with no sparkler. And then that uh, allows you to, I really think, appreciate the hop flavor uh, and the aroma of the beer a lot more because mm. the northern beers are usually a lot more malty. Um, as you go, you know, north in England, uh, there's much less emphasis on the hops, which, interestingly, are grown in the south of England. So maybe they like the hops more where they grow them. And the more malty styles, which, uh, of course, in Scotland, you know, the Scot Scottish ales are very malty with hardly any hop character. Mm. Uh, so if you're trying to emphasize hops, you want to avoid the sparkler, and you probably want to avoid a, a, a larger uh, spout or faucet on the engine. And if you want to serve the uh, the more malty beers, then you can um, consider their use. Uh, maybe for something such as a stout or a porter, a sparkler would be more fitting, I think. So in brewing a, uh, a cask-conditioned beer, where does the process diverge from just your standard uh, beer going into a keg, say? Really, it's it's after primary fermentation. Now, there's one caveat to that. I will say that uh, it's important when formulating a recipe, if you if you know you're going to be cast conditioning it, to think about the use of your yeast, uh, the particular strain. Um, although you could brew a cast conditioned ale with virtually any yeast out there, um, you can even do a cast conditioned lager uh, and brew it with a lager yeast. Typically, though, you want to uh, you want to consider using a British style yeast. Um, there are several reasons for that. One is that's obviously historic. Um, historically, that's the traditional yeast to use. The other thing is that uh, most of the British yeasts are very good flocculators. Mm -hmm. um, they drop out really well. There are several yeast strains available from Y Yeast and White Labs that are. Um, identical to the commercial yeast that some of the larger breweries in England use, and they've been uh, developed over you know, centuries as yeasts that are very good flocculators. They'll drop out very quickly, and they'll clear your beer really well. And since you're not going to be filtering this beer, and you're probably not going to be storing it um, in a secondary, or at least if you are putting in a secondary, probably not for as long as you would a, another uh, forced carbonation beer, you want to make sure that you can get the beer clear uh, when you're serving it. So you, you do the primary fermentation in your in your bucket or your glass carboy as usual? Yes, absolutely. And then um, you can either wait until the primary fermentation is completely finished. In other words, you've reached terminal gravity, which probably won't occur in primary, but you could certainly rack the beer to a secondary uh, you know, another bucket or a, uh, a five-gallon carboy, and then let it uh, reach final gravity. In that case, when you do put the beer into the 
the final serving vessel, whether it's a cask or a corny keg, you're going to need to prime it. You're going to have to use some kind of primings, just like you would if you were bottling the beer, because there's no residual uh, sugar in that beer at that point, so there's no, nothing left to, uh, to carbonate it. Now, the other trick you can do is, uh, as you become more uh, adept in this process, you can actually rack the beer slightly early before it's reached terminal gravity into the final serving vessel. And if you can hit it just about right, which is usually about one or two points specific gravity above what, you, uh, what you're going to get for your final gravity, then you don't need to prime the beer and you'll get the right level of carbonation um, automatically. Now you're really showing off if you can do that. <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably uh, best if you're brewing either a particular recipe over and over again and you know what your final gravity is going to be, or you're at least brewing um, within a pretty close style guideline. So you know generally, you know, oh, well, this beer is probably going to finish you know, somewhere in between 10.08 and 10.10 or 10.10 and 10.12, so you know when to catch the beer and then rack it. Um, the other thing you can do is, you know, it's not rocket science. You can, uh, you can just base it on time. I mean, if you're brewing uh, pretty regularly and you know your primary fermentation with this particular yeast usually takes four or five days or a week, then you know you're, you're probably safe even without taking a gravity uh, as long as you're looking at the airlock activity, you know, that you can rack it after your usual amount of time and then uh, it should be fine. And if it's a little bit more carbonated, um, that just lo requires uh, a longer time to vent the beer uh, for it to come into the right level of condition. And if it's a little under carbonated, well, you either just give it more time or you can, you know, prime it at that point. So what are the priming rates? Are the priming rates the same as bottling? Well, probably not, because usually when you're bottling, you're, you're aiming for a higher level of carbonation. You know, most American styles, I think, are around maybe two, two and a half volumes of carbon dioxide. And with real ale, we're usually talking about uh, quite a bit lower than that, usually one to one and a half volumes. So I would recommend, you know, just starting out, you can tweak this as you go, of course, for your own particular needs, but I would recommend probably somewhere between a third of a cup of priming sugar per five gallons or maybe up to a half of a cup. Huh. rather than the usual three quarters. So that's that's a dramatic difference. Yeah. Well, you know, as I said, you're aiming for almost uh, half the, the level of uh, CO2 by volume. Mm -hmm. So you want to cut it back by about that much. So uh, take us through the process of after, after say, you've reached uh, your final gravity in your, in your fermenter and you're ready to, uh, to go into the, the cask. Yes, then you want to, uh, again, you can take a gravity and see where you are. Uh, the gravity should tell you, if you have a general idea where your final gravity is likely to be, whether you need to prime it or not. If you've left it into the secondary and you know it, it's at terminal or very close, then you know you want to prime it with probably about a third of a cup to half a cup of corn sugar per five gallons. You just prepare your priming solution as normal, but instead of uh, putting it into a bottling bucket, you can put that uh, solution, once it's cool, straight into your uh, serving vessel, the corny keg or the cask, and then you rack the beer into that. Um, add dry hops uh, before you rack the beer if you're, uh, uh, if you're going to do that, and then you uh, seal up that cask uh, or the uh, corny keg, and you don't... Uh, you don't do anything as far as pressurizing it. Uh, I don't even usually purge with CO2 hmm. because you know if you're uh, if you're using a firkin or a pin, you're not you're not there's no way to even do that. So I don't bother to do that if I'm using a corny keg, and I've never really run into any oxidation issues from that. Um, the other thing I should mention is the headspace is very important, um, as you probably you know as all homebrewers probably know. The size of the headspace is critical to getting the right level of carbonation. Mm -hmm. If you fill it all the way to the top of the, the bottle or the keg and there's no headspace, your beer is not going to condition. Or if it does condition, it's going to take months. Uh, whereas if you leave too much headspace, you know, you risk the, the uh, carbonation reaching such a high level, you could even have an exploding bottle. Right. So what I recommend if you're using a corny keg is to have about... 
um, at least one and a half to two, maybe three inches between the level of the beer and the absolute top lip of that uh, that corny keg where it rises up. Mm. So once you put the lid on there, you've probably got about a one and a half to two inch headspace. And that seems to be about the right um, amount of headspace to be able to get it conditioned in a reasonable amount of time. If you've got a session style beer that's maybe four or up to five percent, um, you could probably serve that within a week. Uh, if you use a priming solution or if you catch the terminal gravity, you know, one or two points above its final gravity. Um, stronger beers are probably going to need longer. If you're doing a 5, 6, 7%, you're probably going to want to leave it 10 days, maybe up to two weeks. And then, of course, if you're getting into the uh, really strong beer, the barley wines, you're going to want to leave it longer, not only to, uh, to let it uh, uh, condition well, but also, of course, to mature. And I, I would assume the uh, the same rules apply as far as temperature is concerned with bottling and bottle conditioning. You want it to yes. be in a, in a warm uh, You want to keep it around cellar temperature. Uh, if you keep it really warm, you know, room temperature, you risk the uh, the beer really over conditioning, huh. even if you only leave it for a week. Um, and then that just creates a huge problem because you have this foaming uh, beer and it takes hours, if not days, to get you back down to r- the right serving pressure. So it's good to keep it around 50 degrees. That seems to be about the right temperature for the yeast to be able to condition the beer properly and also for it to age. Um, you want to get the green beer flavors um, that you have in the primary to age out. Uh, so in that you know, week or 10 days that you're uh, letting it condition, you're also developing the flavor of the beer. Uh, and you, it's a fine line trying to balance the condition level, the carbonation level versus the, um, the flavor of the beer. You don't want it to be uh, still green, but of course you don't want to uh, leave, you know, a relatively low strength session beer too long because um, um, the flavor will actually degrade after a while. Uh, it'll improve for the first part of the uh, the secondary, but uh, if you leave it too long, it's not going to get any better, and it'll slowly get worse. And I should say for our international listeners that uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees Celsius. I'm using my little cheat sheet that uh, John from Adelaide, uh, Australia, gave me. So <laughs> That's a good idea. It's really uh, frustrating to me over in England because all the brewers are talking in degrees Celsius and in liters, and I can never figure out what they're talking about. <laughs> we, I, I try to think when I, when I can. Uh, so, so after we have a, the proper conditioning time, and uh, you know your cask is uh, is bunged up and and uh, sealed. Then what? How do you how do you move on from there? Um, that'll depend on the type of vessel we're talking about. If it's a uh, corny keg, it's very easy. Once you've you've let it uh, go, the amount of time you think is probably fit. You know, a week or two weeks. Uh, all you really need to do to uh, to see how it's developing is to uh, pull the, the pressure relief ring and see what kind of noise it makes. Mm. If there's no noise at all, um, you may have a problem. It's either obviously not carbonated. Uh, That may be because you didn't wait long enough. It may be because um, the beer had reached terminal gravity and you didn't prime or you didn't prime enough. Um, But then if you do uh, lift the ring and it's it's got a good amount of pressure on it, you just want to uh, slowly release that pressure. You don't want to uh, pull the ring all the way because uh, you don't want a violent release of the CO2 that could cause the sediment to be disturbed at the bottom, Hmm. Um, and you also don't want to uh, force out too much of the CO2. You do want to keep some uh, in there for um, the mouthfeel that you're looking for. But if you can release off most of the pressure, um, then it's ready to serve. And that's, you know, either hooking it up to a hand pump or um, you can put, uh, you know, a regular um, CO2 cap on it, you know, a, a picnic faucet, uh, if you're trying to go that route, or maybe even hook it up to a tower. But again, uh, you're, unless you have a maybe a higher than normal level of pressure, you're probably not going to be able to serve it on the tower. Uh, you may be able to sort of siphon it out using a picnic faucet by keeping the faucet lower than the level of beer. Um, or, you know, of course, you can use the beer engine. Now, the one thing I didn't mention is if you're if you want to keep using your corny kegs and not invest in another kind of vessel and you don't want to get a hand pump 
you can try the, uh, the other method of serving a corny keg, which is to basically use it as a cask by putting on its side. Hmm. Uh, and we can talk about that. The problem with that is that, obviously, storing it is going to be much more difficult. Um, most of our setups are not, um, you know, don't provide the space to have a corny keg on its side and still be able to serve it via gravity. Because um, if it's in the bottom of a chest freezer or in, in a refrigerator, even if it could physically fit, it would be difficult to be able to gravity dispense that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're doing it this way, you actually want to keep the corny uh, keg not exactly vertical. You want to tip up the back of it higher than the front. So you can do that using some kind of blocks or support. Mm. And then actually, that way you're going to be serving the beer out of the, um, the gas disconnect and venting it using the beer disconnect. And that's because if you put the uh, corny keg on its side with the back slightly up, that dip tube running to the, uh, to the bottom of the keg, now it's on its side. If you keep that dip tube along the top of the uh, keg, then that will actually be reaching into the headspace of the beer. Hmm. And so if you put a black uh, disconnect on there with nothing attached to it, you can actually vent the cask or vent the corny keg that way, and then you'd actually be serving it out of um, the gas disconnect via gravity. Ah, well, that's a neat trick. That's a, a really simple way to do it. Um, I don't think it's ideal, just because, as I said, there are storage issues with that, and you really have to uh, to be careful that way that you that you do have your uh, your black disconnect with the dip tube. Uh, reaching to the right part of the corny keg so you're getting into the headspace. Because if you're not, then you're going to be actually uh, having beer coming out of the uh, the black disconnect when you're trying to <laughs> vent it. When it, they make these uh, the smaller kegs now, uh, which may be handy for that kind of setup. Um, True, and I'm not at all familiar with those, so I wouldn't want to uh, even try to guess as to how you could use those. I've just seen pictures. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, well, that, are there any drawback or are any um, are there any uh, pitfalls uh, that you found in going through this process that uh, that you can share with us? You know, share your failures uh, with us so that uh, we'll know uh, not to do what you did in those cases. Sure, I'm sure I've made uh, more than my fair share of mistakes. Um, I think most of the mistakes, or at least the ones that stick in my memory, are the ones with casks that are. Um, a lot more lively than they should have been. Uh, and that can actually be a lot of fun, especially if you have friends around. Uh, when you're venting uh, one of these um, stainless casks, a firkin or a pin, um, you're using these, these spiles, they're called, and you're venting it from the top of the, uh, the cask through the shive. And you can get quite a, quite a fountain of beer in some cases if you have a well-conditioned beer and you're trying to, uh, to release the pressure. Uh, in fact, I would say most of the, uh, the casts that I end up uh, venting usually make a big mess <laughs> uh, because you have uh, the beer relatively close to the uh, to the spile where it's it's going to be venting, and you use these uh, soft spiles they're called, which are basically usually bamboo or some very porous wood, and you drive this into the hole in the shive uh, after you sanitize the uh, the top of the shive and you sanitize the uh, the spile, and you'll usually get um, either a jet of foam coming out the top, which can go up a few feet, or at least you'll get a, a loud hiss and you'll get beer um, foaming at the top and then running down the side of the cask. So I would recommend where you're venting these casks, even corny kegs just in case, that you, uh, that you put them somewhere where you're going to be uh, able to clean up. <laughs> it's kind of a celeb- uh, celebratory uh, effect there. Yes. And then the other thing I could say is that if you're, if you're using the casks you, when you're tapping them, uh, you have to be pretty careful that when you uh, drive the tap in, you drive it in pretty far. Because I actually had a situation where I was trying to tap this firkin uh, still in one of my refrigerators. And um, I drove the tap in part way, thinking it was in all the way. And I turned around to walk over to get, uh, I don't know what it was, a tube or something to sample it. And I hear this pop, and I look over, and there's a jet of beer coming out of this firkin going <laughs> vertically across the room, and it was hitting um, one of my uh, tables, actually, about 
15 or 20 feet away. <laughs> and I think I probably lost over a gallon of beer that way. Oh, no. And, uh, yeah, try to get a tap back into the, uh, the firkin after it's already um, rocketed out the front. And, of course, it's sitting on the floor far from sanitary at that point. But you have no choice but to grab it and put it back in and hammer it home <laughs> as fast as you can. <laughs> well, it sounds like a lot of fun. And, uh, it certainly is. Um, hopefully, uh, the listeners will be able to have uh, tried cask conditioned ale before they actually go, go about uh, uh, serving it themselves. And uh, there are quite a few places around the U.S. now that, uh, you know, bars and brew pubs that actually serve uh, this style, of, uh, uh, this type of beer. Uh, there's a uh, pretty good database uh, online where you can actually look up to see where uh, a place maybe near you um, that would have uh, cast condition ale. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Alex Hall over in New York who is a great exponent of this beer style, and he's a real um, he's great at uh, spreading the word about the, uh, the real ale. And he's got a website. I think it's www.cask hyphen ale.co.uk if you go to that website and you go to forward slash us forward slash state menu dot html he has a, uh, a listing of all the uh, places that they're aware of in the united states that serves cast condition dale well i have to put that link in the episode description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com so we won't have to wouldn't have to remember all that after listening to it on the iPod on the way to work. <laughs> Great. That's true. Um, and uh, I looked up Arkansas when I was on there this morning, and uh, I see that there's only one place that's listed uh, in Arkansas. It's in Little Rock. I don't know if you've been there, James. Uh, no, I haven't. But, uh, yeah, it's it's pretty easy to find uh, to find the uh, the pubs or the, the breweries in Arkansas because there's only, like, three, maybe four. Uh, kind of a sad state of being. But, it, you know, it's good for home brewers. Absolutely. Well, Benji, this has been fun, and I, I certainly appreciate your time. It's been wonderful. I uh, I think I've just scratched the surface of this interesting topic. Uh, I do welcome any questions. Uh, if you can uh, direct any uh, questions that you get to uh, to me, I'd certainly do my utmost to uh, either try to answer them myself or put people in touch with uh, the people who really know all about this. You, you may regret you've said that. <laughs> I will not. I love to talk about this. It's one of my uh, greatest passions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Nice to talk with you. Well, thanks again to Benji for taking time to talk to us. Uh, I'll post a link to everything we talked about in the uh, description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Sounds like fun. I'd love to be serving some firkin' beer here at the house. (laughs) And I'm sure that my friends and family would immediately get tired of that joke. <laughs> if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And don't forget we need your homebrew horror stories, those days when brewing goes wrong and, and what you learn from it, what we can pass on to everybody else. The uh, reminder, the uh, the 2008 Brewers Logbooks are here. Check them out on our site and check out the new low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash. And you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of an Arkansas summer where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer to uh, lager the beer. There are also our original DVDs and Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. And we've got new combo deals out there. Save you guys a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online, and I'll box it up myself. I got the paper cuts to to prove it. Remember, uh, also, we have shirts and hats, including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate Flocculate shirt. And uh, we've also got, we haven't got any pictures lately from from, uh, people in interesting places wearing their basic brewing shirts. 
we've got a gallery on the site with uh, everybody in in basic brewing gear in really, really cool places. Uh, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are 2 gigabit, no, 2 gigabyte kit. That's 1 gigabyte times 2 upgrade for a Dell Dimension 4600 system, DDR, PC3200, non-ECC, CL equals 3. And Apple 16 gigabyte iPod Touch. Oh, jealous? I'm jealous. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what there, so no worries. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. Well, that's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson, our buddy down in Austin, who also designed our logo. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.